and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the executive editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, the Chief Data Officer, moderated each month by Tony Shaw. This month, Tony will be joined by Tom Redman to discuss competing with data, strategy, and organization. He will, Tom will be joining us remotely. You won't see us, his name up there, but you'll definitely hear him as we move through the slides. And just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag diversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce to you and turn over the webinar to the Dataversity founder and CEO, Tony Shaw. Hello and welcome, Tony. Many thanks. Welcome. And hello, Tom. Good to, uh, good to have you with us today, Tom. Um, so, data, I think, is a particularly timely topic. Um, so in terms of the emergence of the chief data officer role or any senior management role that has to deal with the strategic application of information today, a strategy is really one of the first things we should talk about, but all too often it's come at some point after trainers come off the rails and, and we're trying to figure out what direction we're really going in with the sort of initiatives that rely on, on on, and good information today. So, um, you know, data strategy should should ask questions like, like we're going to compete with data, and if you are, then, then you're going to do that. Uh, whether you're planning to be an innovator or a follower, there's good reason to be in uh, on those those uh, categories. And can you ex execute on the plans that you have? What is your strategy for Ensuring that you have the talent required to to compete in the realm of uh, of data management. Day. So, uh, with all that said, um, I'm thrilled to be introducing you today to our speaker, Dr. Thomas Redmond. Tom, also known as the Data Doc, is the president of Navisync Consulting Group, and he's helped really hundreds of organizations to understand the importance of data about the data programs, the data quality programs, and realize the sustained improvements that that good management can bring. Tom's an internationally known lecturer. He's the author of dozens of papers, articles, books. He blogs regularly for the Harvard Business Review. And in fact, in that particular role, uh, he's become one of the, the most influential spokespeople for the, the data strategy movement the notion of being data-driven. His fourth book was called Data-Driven, Prodding from a Most Important Business Asset. And I would credit Tom probably being the first person to use that data-driven term uh, to, to point about the importance of data. And of course, it's been borrowed many times since then. Prior to forming Navisync, Tom started and, and led Data Quality Labs uh, at labs uh, under the auspices of at and uh, And that's where he and his team were among the first to extend quality principles, data, and information on a systemic scale. So it is with great pleasure that I hand you over to Tom Redman to talk about competing with data today. Welcome to Tom. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you for that kind introduction. and. Uh, um, and thank you to to everyone who's uh, carved out an hour to uh, talk about my favorite topic in uh, in the business world today, and and that's data. Um, I've been working on data a long, long time, and Shannon, if you would go to the second slide, and um, and for most of that time, I, I felt like the a little kid in the back seat of his parents' cars, and and mom and dad have have looked up the car, and and the plan is is to go to grand. And, and grass is some, you know, some way down the road, and uh, of course, about ten minutes out of the driveway, you know, what do the little, little kids start saying? You know, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And in the data space, I, I, I feel like, like I've been asking, are we there yet? For you know, longer than I care to admit, and 
And so years ago, I, I I began to despair that we were, you know, we were going to get to to data at grandmas. And and uh, but but the last few years have been extremely encouraging. I'm going to explain why in in just a minute. But but um, you know, just just out here on this slide, that the data at grandmas is going to be everything we think it's cracked up to be. There's going to grandma's house is built on this solid foundation. That's the that's quality data. Data, the data we're not working day in and day out, so we can conduct the most mundane operation or or make the most mundane decision. It's going to be so good that you know we can actually trust it at any level, from from operational to day in and day out decisions to to strategic planning, and really going to put that data to work. We're going to use those data to improve product and service. Um, people top to bottom are going to use them to, to make better decisions. Our organizations are, are going to be better as a result. And every now and then, with us is going to find some real nugget data that leads to fundamental innovations and, and creates new industries. And and the things that follow from that are, are, are you know, the economy is going to grow. I and mean, think about how long we've been stuck with real growth, it appears to me that high quality data is our the collective our best chance for for, for real growth, right? Uh, we can trust the financial system. Healthcare is is better and less costly, and we're all freer and and, and safer as a result. I mean, that's view of data at grandma's, and and as I said, I, I I'm now convinced we're going to get there, and we're going to get there in in my lifetime, and. And the reason I'm convinced that we're going to get there has nothing to do with anything that's going on in, in the traditional data space. It's what's going on and the conflicts that regular people are seeing with data in their day in and day out, personal lives and work lives. So, Shannon, if, if you could go to slide three, I prepared a couple of vignettes to, to, to illustrate uh, slide three in, involves a junior executive. She happens to be from Columbus, Ohio. She's um, she's won some contest at her company and is in New York City for the for the annual sales conference. It's her first time in in New York City, and she's managed to to bring her husband along. They're all excited about it, and um, and it's a Broadway show, and um, and it's the first time they've seen a Broadway show. All is great, and. And um, and they walk out of the Broadway show, and her phone jingles, and a message comes up that says, "Ice mojitos, clearing hole right around the block. Uh, show this coupon." And, um, and and here's the interesting thing: What do you think about that? Right? Is that the most terrific thing ever? Something that extends a glorious evening for this woman and and her husband? Or, or is it just plain creepy that uh, that that people know where she is and and what she's doing to such an extent that they they can make uh, a, an offer like that? I don't know the answer to that, but that's a question that that, that people in all walks are, are 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 facing again and again. My, my second vignette involves a family practitioner and and. Uh, um, what's patients? Uh, let's just say it's a guy my age. He's you know trying to do too much on the weekend, and, and he strained his knee. And he comes in on Monday morning, and and uh, and the family practitioner's got to decide what to do. And and in in the past, you know, just months ago, he he in this case, the family practitioner is a male would have would have sent the patient off for an MRI. But um, but lately, he's gotten a directive from the insurance. Company insurance company is analyzed the results of thousands of MRIs for injuries similar to this one, and concluded they don't lead to better treatments, and they're not paying for them anymore. So what do we have here? Is this just the best thing ever that big data has allowed us to gain insights that make the family practitioner more effective, or is it an encroachment on on his domain? And, and again, reasonable people can be on either side of that, right? Many people may even think it's both. Um, Shannon, if you go on to the next slide now, slide slide five, the the the, the thing yet I'll um, I'll give and is a rising middle manager, and, and she's 
in the process of, of, of preparing her first presentation for the board. And in the process of, of uh, practicing, rehearsing the day before, she notices this number that looks strange. And so she calls her assistant in, and her assistant looks at it and agrees it looks strange. And, and so she sends him off to track it down. And um, and he finds out that, indeed, the sales number for the widgets department is incorrect. He corrected it in her presentation, and um, uh, and she's all ready to go. Goes off, gives her presentation, is a big success, right? And it turns out the correction they made was the linchpin of the discussion that that follows. And and she gets back to her office. She's so excited. She she awards her her uh, assistant on the spot award uh, dinner for two, two hundred dollars at any place he, he wants to, to to go to eat. And and um, and then she says to him last, you know. We better check those numbers from the widget department every, every day, right? Every time we need them, we'd better check them. Notice what she didn't do. She didn't call the widget department up and say, hey, we found a problem in, in your numbers. She she didn't have the courtesy of doing that. She left the others in her, her company to be victimized by the same data that she would. And in particular, the widget department, she didn't give them an opportunity to get to the bottom of of the issue. And you think about this one. Is this just great because our rising executive has been successful in her first big her big try at the board? Or or is this just complete managerial irresponsibility by leaving others victimized? And not uh, not making it possible for a, co- uh, a department to get to the root cause of the problem. Again, reasonable people can disagree on, on that. And, and um, so, so uh, you know, so the next slide, Shannon presents a, a another vignette. I'd like to go on to slide five. I mean, I've I, I've printed, I've talked about three of these things. I I hope everybody listening says. Hey, if he can do three, he can probably do 30. And if I can do three, the collective us can do any number we want. You know, things that that, that are tough issues, the data is is right in the middle of that, that everyone in their in their personal life or their work life is is smack in the in the middle of them. Um, I have a client who points out that you know, no matter what discussion they're having in inside inside his business data come up they come up in every single conversation so so what's going on here and and i've sort of uh slide seven is is set up as a point counterpoint slide i mean individually this is just work right these are the tough social and organizational issues that managers get to deal with every day um you know similarly on point i mean the successful those who won the 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 war and, and develop the best product. And they've always taken advantage of, of of superior data, right? There's big, there's plenty of big data successes all over, right? And so, you know, so there's a way of looking at this where you know things are just are just uh, are just swimming. And but the counterpoint to individually is collectively these these issues su- suggest something deeper, right? Um, and and and, and yes, while well, there's good historical roots for data and and the the advantages of superior data, the advantages that stem from superior data, they're just exploding everywhere, right? And and, and finally, as impressive as the big data successes are, if if you really take a, a hard look at the financial crisis, what you see is is a colossal failure of data. We 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 see things that vended their way into mortgage applications that three steps later were bundled with something where 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 an organization or an individual couldn't evaluate the risk and the risk was far far higher and 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 turned south. So now on slide, I mean here's my opinion. I think reasonable opinion uh, people can be all over the map, but. My belief is that a full strength data revolution is is brewing and and it's not just big data. Now, big data is what's making the news and and um and and you know, companies are all excited about about data scientists and, and so forth. 
but it, there's, there's a whole lot more. For, for every two big data things that are going on, there is, there's a hundred little data things going on, playing out in departments and individual vignettes and, and so forth. Now, I'm a historian, but, but I, I can read, and it does appear to me that all revolutions are chaotic, messy, and inherently unpredictable. Hang around for a while and then move at dizzying speed. Certainly, that was the case to the quality revolution in manufacturing. I don't think anybody's going to be in touch is going to remain untouched. I don't think anybody has any job now that doesn't involve uh, involve enormous amounts of data and, and will involve much, much more. And roadmaps. Um, by the time people have figured their way through the data revolution and and write those roadmaps, it'll, it'll it'll be too late. No point, and really, on point, especially here is is the technology challenges to 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 pull off what we need to pull off on data are tall, but they pale in, in comparison to the organizational challenges. So in slide nine, I've I've noted the the four most common things I hear is as I wander around and and to companies and. And the first is, you know, we're data rich and we're information poor. And 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 you hear this in in lots and lots of guises. What it betrays is is is, is that the organization has not really thought through how it's going to use its data, never mind compete with the data. Um, another thing I hear all the time is, is you know, I've been in this industry 25 years, these data couldn't possibly be any better. And and it really betrays for me an institutionalization of of just accepting mediocre quality data, uh, and accepting the workarounds and the high costs that that uh, that come with them. Tom, you got to keep in mind that, that we're much more siloed than other industries uh, that that I work with. It's one of these amazing statements that I have because you know people don't know what's going on in those other industries or with those other companies, but they've concluded that that they're much more siloed. And of course, silos are the enemy of, of, of data here. And finally, some version, often not even spoken, but, but so deep in our psyche that if it's in the computer, like data's in the computer, it, it, it must be IT's responsibility. And um, and so these these um, observations have led me to conclude at, at, at the top of slide 12, these organizations are unfit for data, and, and remarkably so. Now, I started making this claim in public um, two or three years ago, and, and I thought there would be an enormous backlash. I thought that people would would um, would really push back hard disagreement. But so far, I've not seen that at all. People, by and large, want this once this is stated, you know, understand that it's capturing an essential truth. About where we are with our organizations and and, and data today, and um, and you can see on the, on the remainder of the slide, I've I've called out some specifics. I've I've translated the the I hear in, into some more generic specifics. But but you know the first, and I th think this is really really important. Is we don't know how to compete with data, nor have very many companies gained enough experience to actually even decide how they're going to do that, right? We do not have the experience to know how to compete with data. By the way, when, when I hear the word strategy, it to me is always in a marketplace connotation. Um, when somebody says, well, what's your data strategy? That is the same as how are you going to compete with data? Strategy in that sense to me does not mean high level plan, but, uh, but how are you going to achieve advantage uh, in your marketplace? We have to tap Talent um, up and on the organization. The uh, I think the uh, the McKinsey guys got it directly correct uh, in in their big data report some years ago, when noted that that uh, the country, the United States, and not including the rest of the world, I believe, but the United States was probably about a hundred thousand data scientists short, a million switched on managers short of of what we're going to need. Uh, we've already mentioned that silos get away get in the way of data sharing, and 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 quality is is really an interesting one because there's lots and lots of examples and lots and lots of industries of, of quality done right, and and the advantages that companies 
gain for themselves when they when they manage data quality. But in too many, it's essentially un, unmanaged. And um, you know, and then the the, the last bullet is you know those who've gotten responsibility for data outside of IT have, have, have simply done better, particularly in the in the quality sphere. And and, and step one is is getting it out now. Now, I don't know. I mean, as I, you know, I look around and I read all the management stuff and stay current and so forth. My conclusion is working through the, these issues is the management challenge uh, of our generation. And, and I want the capital T, capital H, capital E to, to, to be fully understood. This is not an important issue or one of the important issues. It is the most important issue. And and uh, part of the reason it's the most important issue is is it it creates such high leverage for the other ones. Um, so so let's move on to to, to slide eleven. I I, I want to just summarize this uh, uh, the, 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 this up. I mean, and here's the challenge for leadership. By leaders, I don't mean just people in senior positions inside organizations, those in at any level in any spot in in their company who are willing and have the courage to to step in front and. And the challenge, in a nutshell, is that a full-strength data revolution is blue, is brewing, but today's organizations aren't ready. And the revolution's not, not going to wait for your organization to get ready. You're going to have to to start doing that on the fly. At high level, there's there's um, there are two specific pieces of advice. The first is figure out how you're going to compete with data, and the second is is build organizational capabilities. Let's talk a little bit about uh, about these things. Um, Tony mentioned my my so go to slide twelve, please, Shannon. Uh, Tony mentioned my my book, Data Driven, and and one of the things that that, that I did there that I, I was very proud of and and has held up pretty well was 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 I I, I tried to to understand the different ways there are to put data to work, and. Um, and uh, so I brought that slightly up to date since since Data Driven was was published, and and so you can see I think there's about 18 distinct ways to to to, to get it, and and um, you know and what's right for organizations. There's going to be a lot of different ways to to compete with data, and and um, and as best I can tell, I mean so here's the here is the, the 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 best list that we have now. My fervent hope. Is that in about ten years somebody writes a paper and they go, well, now Redmond made a big beginning, but he missed this, he missed this, he missed this, he missed about twenty-seven new ways to have developed to to to, to data to work to to compete with data. So on slide twelve, now now eighteen different ways. I I think these boil down to for basic strategies, and, and the reason I think this is because. Three of these strategies are, are basic strategies in, in anything. They're sort of the the innovation strategy, the stay closest to customer strategy, and the and the be the low cost provider strategy. And, and those translate as as um, create advantage through innovation, through the big data, through the advanced analytics, and 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 doing that and continuing to do it. It's not about finding one nugget. It's about building an organization such that you can, can find, find big nuggets and little nuggets and so forth and get those nuggets out into the world and, and create an advantage for yourself. Because the customer strategy is a, is a content strategy. The low-cost provider, the simplest way to take cost out of most businesses right now is simply to improve data quality. Um, you know, there, there, there is so much hidden rework, so many hidden data factories in companies today, that, that high quality can can be that the money to be saved is is just enormous. And the fourth one is building a data driven culture, and and um, and you know data driven's been around and, and talked a little bit about it in my book. I mean, I think the short way of understanding this is we use data, we bring data together into the decision making equation a smart way. We combine it with our intuitions and our tacit knowledge and so. To make better decisions, top to bottom, bottom to top, left to right, right to left, individual settings and, and group settings, and and I don't really see anything equivalent to that in, in the classic in the classic um, in classic uh, strategies. But but I'm very encouraged that 
that that that that that strategy will be available to some. I also think it's going to be the most difficult to pursue. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I I think the the basic the organizations are going to have to do in the, in the next several years is they're going to have to gain some experience with all of these strategies. I have to understand what their competitors might do and what the startup down the road is likely to do and, and, and pick horse that um, that makes the best sense for, for them. Um, I kind of before, before before we, we, we kind of dive into what, what you can do organizationally about this, let's mention one content strategy uh, because a, um, a people may not be be too familiar with it. The others are, have, have sort of been around. There's more on them. But informationalization, the, the, the basic concept of informationalization is to make existing products and services more valuable by building more data into them. And so my, you know, the, the the obvious example is is the GPS, which uh, first uh, got built into cars and and obviated the the, the need for the map. Uh, but but a car is more valuable because you can put into it where you want to go, and and um, and uh, it will know where you are and sort out turn by turn directions for you. Um, it's a big time strategy. Michael Eisner, you know, it's in one of the top half a dozen executives of of um of our era has pointed out that content is king. And then informationalization is not the only content strategy, but but big one. And and as you work with companies, so far I haven't come up with anything that, that couldn't be informationalized. And I mean I want a favorite example of mine, my my mentor Bland Godfrey suggested, which was which was the hospital gown. And there's no more mundane product in a hospital gown, but the folks at um, at in state are working at informationalizing it, they're building sensors in, so it's continually monitoring the patient's blood pressure and and various other other devices, a little RFID in, device in there that's transmitting on a continuous basis the results of those measurements to to the nurses station and sending alarms when when needed. Um, Information is available to all. It's it's a um, and this is is one of the reasons that that, that that they like it. Everybody ought to be considering this strategy. It's not require. You don't really need data scientists, right? You don't need massive changes to your your organization. Um, everybody should be thinking about an informationalization strategy. It may not be right for them, but they be, should be thinking about it. Um, one of the reasons they may not be right for it is, is you know, don't do it right. You're just going to know customers. They're they're, they're already in information overload, and and um, you know one of the things that's not an example of informationalization is when an ad says to learn more, visit our website at da 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 da. da. So, I mean, well, you know, people know they can visit your website by now, and and um, and you're just dumping a lot of stuff on them that 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 they don't need. All right. So point one is going to be you have to sift through your your uh, strategy and figure out what's right for you. And by the way, this isn't just on the company level. This can be in the department level. It can be in your work group level. It it, it can be at, at any level. Um, what are the, some of the specific things we're learning organizationally? Um, and and so I have a, a half a dozen slides on that. Shannon, if, if you're on slide 15 now, First is, is, as far as I can tell, uh, high de- high quality data is a prerequisite. I mean, it is both a legitimate strategy on its own, but for for any of the other strategies, you need more quality data than we have. You may not need super quality data, like to take every last nickel out of your operations, uh, but you need you do need higher quality data. And of course, the reason is. In functionalization, you expose you expose data, and um, and when you expose the data, if it's wrong, you anger customers. And you know we all know examples of where that's happened with GPS and, and people providing the GPS, doing themselves any any friends when they when they send the drivers in, into the into the middle of the ocean. Now, good the other good thing about data quality. Is we know how to do it. There's lots and lots of examples in company and lots of industries that that, that really made 
substantial improvements. And, and I want to cut through everything on slide 16 and, and, and sort of sort of look at it in, in a way that would be explained the last couple of years. And and it, and it kind of goes like this: from the from from a perspective of a piece of data, only two moments in its lifetime really matter. One of them is, is the moments it's used. And and in the moments it's used, it's either fit for purpose, it helps complete the operation, make the decision, uh, or make the plan, or, or, or whatever is, is going on at the time, at, at, at the moment of use. It either does so in an appropriate way, and to be a little bit simplistic, or it doesn't. It has to be rework, people have to go get confirmatory evidence, what, whatever it is, right? So that moment of use is very important. It's when the data either adds value or not. But when that data is going to meet those needs at the moment of use is by and large uh, determined at the moment the data is created. And there may be a tangled path as illustrated by that greenish arrow um, from from the moment of creation to to, to the moment of use. But, but whether the data is, is of high quality, fit for purpose, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is determined at at the at the moment of use and more or less set at the moment of creation, right? So, so what do we have to do? This is we have to have those two moments talking to each other. We have to have the moment of use saying, "Hey, this is what I need there," and um, and if that doesn't happen, then the moment of creation, whether it meets the needs or not, is is just is is just pure dumb luck. And so the the whole reason we have data quality management is connect those two moments in time. Right now, our organizations are complex. I mean, if we just had the man on the left and the, and the woman on the right, you say, "Hey, you guys talk to each other, right?" But well, making that happen for the sale and and the different you know the different organizations and so forth across space and time is the reason we need data quality management. Uh, now, now, final point on this slide, and and uh, and it gets to where should management for data quality reside. And I simply like to point out that neither of the two moments that matter occur in IT, right? Um, it does not make sense to have lead responsibility for data quality reside at some point other than those two most important points. Shannon, if, if you go to slide 16, um, when when it's done right, this is the reason that data quality is is such a is a strategy of on on its own for for providing a low cost, being the low cost provider, and also you know just just accelerates the other strategies. And you can see the picture is is what happens when it goes right. There's a lot going on in this slide from setting requirements to getting some measurements, and there's four improvement projects buried in there. Uh, but you can see that, you know, from the time this started until about 18 months later, there's I'm gone from sort of, you know, 50% of the data is okay to, to, to 95 plus percent of full order of magnitude improvement. In a particular example that, that, that I'm giving, average savings of $500. I mean, it's just that those who are leading your data quality programs and responsible for it make pictures that that look like this one. This is what we're trying to achieve, and and time and time again, we're we're finding that it's 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 um, fully reasonable to expect. She'd like to slip to skip to slide 19 now, if you would. Um, the thing we're beginning to learn from an organizational question is is how to answer. Well, where do we put our analysts? And what you can see is is a spectrum of possibilities. On the top scale is, is the the sophistication required in, in the analytics. Basic process improvement requires a bit of analytics, uh, and uh, and so that's over on the far left. And and then if you're trying to really compete through innovation, you know, make the the discovery your industry's equivalent of the discoveries of the Higgs boson, then you've got to be over on the right. And uh, and so experience is teaching us that. That for things closer to the left, analytic, the analytics team and the analysis ought to be closer and closer to the line. And from things further and further to the right, 
um, which require greater specialization, greater time going down more more blind alleys and so forth. The um, the organization, the analytics organization, ought to be set up more or less in a permanent lab without day in and day out responsibilities like those in the line. And of course, there's things you know in in between on the spectrum, and part of the challenge is, is to figure out where you lie. And 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 get yourself um, put your analyst uh, in the right spot based on how you lie. The next thing we're beginning to learn is expressed on on slide twenty, and and the top of the slide says to think end to end. And and um, my view, I I'm I'm sort of calling this this end to end thing the D to the fourth process, right? Data discovery, delivery, and dollars. And 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 the basic idea is is you know, in terms of your success at, at competing with data, it's more or less going to be dictated by by how you do on the worst of these things, right? So, you know, we've already talked about you need some high quality data, right? You need to be able to find something truly interesting in it. You need to either get the results to a decision maker into a process, into a new product or services, or or what it is, and you need to figure out how to make money from it. And and individually, none of those are easy, and, and, and collectively, they're really, really hard. And, and, and so you're going to get in front of that. Then from the very beginning, it's really important to, to, to begin thinking end to end. I think the experiences and what was learned in the good old-fashioned industrial labs really, really pertinent here. Slide 21 is, is um, a slide that that I've spent the last seven or eight years really trying to understand. And I think it's the most important point in, in competing with data. Um, it's the one that I frankly least understand, even though I've been, been thinking about it so long. But but as I understand, you know, when you really want to compete, it helps to have something the other guy doesn't. Uh, and you know, in just good old-fashioned industrial, industrial uh, in the industrial world, it helped to have a a process that others didn't. It helped to have a core of knowledge that others didn't. It may help to have a patent, like a patented drug that that others didn't. That you could protect and you could make and sustain competitive advantage for some time. And and um, it appears to me the same is going to be true for data. It's going to be helpful to have some data that others don't. And, and so part of the trick is is to sort out which data of you yours are uniquely your own and and um and 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 which you want to keep from becoming standardized. Now by the way, I mean you get to just define your data any way you want and and your business processes create more every day. And so you know you, you get to build as much subtlety and, and nuances you can in 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 your data. Um, I mean that's not universally true. You need to standardize some data so you can communicate and so you can keep operations uh, inexpensive as you deal with others. But but having something and a small fraction of your data that others haven't is is um, in my view going to be key to. Long-term six. And by the way, I mean there's deep historical roots for that. So, if you look at uh, at companies like uh, S and P, right? They have something called a QSIP. Nobody else has has a QSIP, and there's plenty of other examples like that. Um, I think this is one of these things that organizations have to really, really start thinking thinking so um, uh, a lot about, right? Uh, access to data that everyone else has. You may be able to get an advantage for a few minutes. Minutes, but also copy you, and um, and you won't sustain it. At 22, the the next thing that uh, that we're really learning is, you know, this really is about talent. It's talent up and down the organization charts. Um, it's about making everybody smarter. It's um, in my view, I I I I I did a little look at the people that I've known that have considered data scientists over the over my experience at Bell Labs and since then and and I've known a number of, of, of good ones, but the truly great ones are are short supply. The truly great ones who just ask different kinds of questions and think about things in new ways. And it's really helpful to 
to uh, to have a few of those. Um, we've already talked about you know for every for every manager you know every good analyst you need you you you, you need dozens of of good plus managers and and uh, just just to support that so a uh, clever analysis that I've ever known about uh, in in the, in my time working with data that that actually bore fruit right um, the the analyst got a lot of recognition but there's some manager some un- who's the real unsung hero. Who, who took a chance and put his or her career on the line and said, let's take this forward. And, um, and of course, the leadership is essential in, in revolution. Um, and sooner or later, the stone-cold, sober evaluation of, of what we can pull off is, is just absolutely essential. We're covering a lot of ground, and, and, um, and uh, that, that, that's by design. The... The last thing I, I really want to suggest we're really beginning to learn, and and, and I think this is this is a, a, a essential is is this is going to take a lot of people, and and it's going to take a, a new structure. Um, five six years ago, I began to ask myself, well, what are some of the other things that that uh, companies view as assets? And the obvious answer is people and and uh, financial resources and. And um, so, so you, you, you look at, at how they're managed and, and, I, and then say, okay, well, what does that imply for data? And, and I found thinking about the, the, the way people are managed most useful in thinking about, you know, where we're going with data. And, and so, so the, um, the, in people management, you, you, you sort of observe these traits. I mean, the, the thing there really is a corporate HR department. It really does have some, some line work, like succession planning and setting the pay skills and picking out the insurance um, we we'll use next year and and so forth. And and you know that's one level. And and then um, and there's departmental HR, which which you know may help people uh, conduct their searches for for candidates and. And uh, deal with problems and set up specific training programs for the departments and so forth. But the thing then that really strikes you is, is that every single manager is is responsible for the day in and day out people management. So corporate HR and departmental HR are are doing high level and policy things, and real management is going in de- is going on every day in line with your managers. And, and if you, you, you sort of take those traits, and say maybe you can take more, and then go over and say, okay, well, what is it going to take to manage to, to manage the data assets? And and you get these the parallel answers to that. Um, and you can see I've written them written down. So by and large, I mean, it is people in organizations that create data and use data day in and day out. And and so that, that's where the responsibility to create high quality data is, is going to reside, and that's the responsibility to put data to work in, in novel ways is is going to arrive. And 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 that's the essence of what this is all about. We we spend a lot of time, I think, thinking about well, you know, what's the chief data office going to look like, and uh, and and where we really ought to be spending our time. Say, what's going to go on in regular departments, and how are we going to create the chief data office to to make them more effective? So, Shen, if if you go on to last uh, slide, which is slide 24, I mean, I, I I hope I've excited you. You know, we're going to get the grandmas. I I uh, going to get the grandmas in in my lifetime. Organizations are going to be there. In the next half dozen years, others it's going to take longer. And if they don't get the grandmas, we're really not going to have to worry about. Them. I mean, it just simply will will not exist. And and I, and I and I hope that's one way that that, that scared you. Um, just to state, I mean, the, the the leadership challenge is is really really clear. These things that are going on that that uh, you know these in conflicts that everyone is facing are real. They're all encompassing. Right, people in the organization are, are the least of it, and not ready. And I have to get ready. The revolution's not not going to wait. For most, it's time to set a strategy. You don't have the experience, 
but it is time to, to start moving on that on that level and thinking about what's the way for us to compete with data. Um, quality is prerequisite. And step one, you know, move responsibility for data quality out of IT. Uh, I don't know any organization that that um, that did that, then moved it back. Experiment. Think end to end. Right. Start out which data are strategic, which you can protect, which will give you, which uniquely your own, and um, and then begin to build the organizational capabilities uh, we're going to talk about. Pete, I mean, the, the you know, if I was going to say one thing, is, is the people, you know, and particularly people with data in their title is, is be courageous. Um, you, you know, if you, if you, if you make a if decision and go off in a particular direction, there's a likelihood you're going to be wrong, and uh, um, and, and you're going to get hammered for it. But if you stay where you are now and don't make a move, it is a rock dead certainty that you're going to get hammered and and be wrong. So you want to increase the likelihood that you're going to stay alive. Um, be smart, pick something, and then move and move fast and aggressive. So. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, Shannon, I believe we have time for questions. And, um, you know, pick up this one. Well, uh, thanks, Tom. We have uh, about 15 minutes, and we can deal with numerous questions. So um, I'm going to invite everybody to submit your questions in the little Q&A window in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, it's the easiest place for us to pick those up. I'm going to ask a uh, to get us started, though, Tom, because you do a lot, lot of civil consulting, boardroom consulting, and I'm just guessing that you've seen uh, a change in understanding and a change in the sort of questions that when that C-suite are asking over the past uh, five years. Um, can you tell me how it's changed and... and uh, you know, is, is the level of understanding uh, appropriate for the, the sort of um, issues that are being faced, or there's still a lot of misconceptions? Uh, well, well, I, I, I mean, my experience is I, I, I think that there's there's a few organizations where boards and and, and C-suiteers are, are really asking the question. You know, the true tops of corporations. I mean. I mean that's pretty rare. Um, in terms of you know like the top people I'm dealing with, I mean it's certainly true that the level of people who are asking the questions has has gone up, and and um, the the organizational level of of the questions has gone up, and and then questions in you know I'm asked have, have shifted uh, a lot more from the how do we to you know what's the organization we have to be where are we going to put that who are we looking who are we looking for to lead the, that that organization right how much money are we going to have to spend how fast can we possibly go the questions are are um, you know they're more difficult to answer they're more strategic they're they're very little you know of how to and more of the who to kind of variety that makes sense sure Actually, a nice segue to a couple of the questions that Richard has asked. I'm going to jump to the second one here and ask you, I know you have some firm opinions, and I think Richard, too, from um, what I recall of some of his LinkedIn posts, but um, what's your feeling about the role of the chief data officer? And um, is it desirable or not? Um, and how do you compare that role to, say, the CIO or CTO role? Um, well, I, 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 yeah, I do have strong opinions on this. I, I, um, I did a uh, chief data officers conference uh, summer, and, uh, and I don't want to say which one it was, but, but I was so mad after it. But, um, I had to hold back before you know writing my blog because um, because I was angry. I wanted to like really think it through and 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 you know to, to uh, in in all companies and in, in in lots of things you know C is the C thing has 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 lost a little bit of its its meaning right. 
Um, I, I think you you need a C band when you are truly committed to the idea that we're going to figure out how we're going to compete with data, that it is a business priority to do so, that that the board is recognizing that this is either either a real issue now or it's an emerging issue now, and you have the stomach to to at least proceed. Um, you know, and I think it's the same as is any time something's a C, right? You know, if a, a C is a, the C for human resources, you're effectively saying, look, we need people to compete, right? If it's a C for finance, you know, we need we need to manage our finance as well to to compete. And and frankly, I mean, you know, most CIOs in, in the last few years don't meet that standard anymore. They've They've been pushed down, and maybe not pushed down in name, but but pushed down in in terms of of level of responsibility. Um, so, it's my view. I I don't think I don't think you should hire a C until you're 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 ready to take the plunge. Um, it's differently if you're just going to stick your toe in the water, and I do think you ought to be sticking your toe in the water. But you don't need a C to stick your toe in the water. Okay. As you can hear, that it's recently lengthy, and I, I think I understand the question. So I can read it out. And if we need to interpret, we can we can backtrack a little. So, Dear asked here today, many companies are restrategizing on the basis of technology innovation and operate and uh, from an operational standpoint. It is for a company not to compete on data and only focus on technology innovation and operations because of that, that is what appears to be happening in the majority of industry. So, I mean, I, I, is the question, is it, is it possible to ignore the data? In part, I, uh, my interpretation here is you had said um, at one point in the presentation about um, the strategic advantages of, of owning data or having access to data that nobody else did. And I, I think right. I thought the question is prompted by the notion that um, strategic advantage is, is uh, often gained by operational or, or just being able to execute better than the next person, whether you're using the same data or not. Yeah. So look, I, I do think that if you want to take cost out, if you want to compete in being the low cost provider, right, then you know, then quality will help you do that. It 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 is clear that, but that's a da- I mean, that is a particular data focus. Now, now whether you whether you drive that, you know, you're thinking about that through the technology or or aligning. With the technology, I, mean, I, don't, I don't. I don't have a feel for that. I, I do know that that you know that almost everyone who's made the the kind of quality improvements that showed on that you know in the middle of the day there, those are magnitude improvements. They, they they did that outside of of their tech organizations. Um, so I'm not sure I understand the the, the question. I, I I think everything okay. is possible, but I. I think I think you know you're. It's risky to ignore data, um, okay. and I'm just kind of thinking about the industries I've I've worked in. Um, you know, we're ignoring data. Okay. Uh, okay. We probably have more questions than we're going to be able to deal with um, right now. So I'm going to have to select a couple last sequence. Um, this this one though I think is uh, probably typical in many organizations. Steve has asked here our senior. Man- Management is silo driven. It gives examples of finance, HR, etc. There's no overall data champion. What kind of uh, in terms of your data is valuable and can be leveraged better uh, would be useful for senior management to hear? I suppose this means senior corporate management, which does manage the silos. I believe that's the intention of the question, yes. Across, yeah. across those different silos, what do senior managers need to understand in order to get out of their silo-driven mentality? Right. So, 
so, so I mean, here's the way I think I'd, I'd think through that. I mean, you know, most, most data exists in silos, and it and it really does never leave. And managing that, that data inside the silo is perfectly fine, right? Um, you know, we set up silos to, to to create some efficiencies and build some expertise, and the data that's just used inside those silos. I mean, it can stay there. the The problem is is that most organizations in you know, a lot of the value they create, or in some cases, the the understanding of what the organization is doing, the management um, of of across the silos depends on data that that, that needs to cross silos. Um, you know, I ran into an organization just the other day, and and in order for them to deliver something to a customer, Department A has to do something, Department B has to do something. C has to do something, and D has to do something, and and look, and 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 senior management needed to understand the end to end time to start at A and get through D, and 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 so they wanted to, you know, get cycle time. And what they found was is that A knew how long it took to get through A, B how long it took to get through B, and so forth, but there was no understanding of how long it took to get from A to B and from B to C, and. and and uh, so the way I I think about answering the question is 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 find out that there's something that that your management can't do because it doesn't have a window into the connectivity of of the silos and and that's the data that 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 needs to to be managed on a you know on a corporate level right to so manage the corporation. Um, and and you know and in most organizations find there's tons of that stuff. Um, okay. So it's front lady, the data that needs to be managed on a corporate level is corporate data. I mean, it's used for corporate purposes. So um, you point strongly that, that uh, should get out of the data business, or the data should be managed by the business rather than by IT. However, you know, as a practical matter, I think she inevitably gets drawn into the the technology questions and um, the, the things that the business doesn't yet know about how to manage its data. My question to you is, how do you sort of structure things in that context so that IT can be useful uh, but not take responsibility that that's the, the the message that you're delivering there. Yeah. So, so let me first point this at IT. Um, I um, I have a, I have a director of of marketing now, and and she's been insisting, Tom, you, everything you say comes across as as your anti IT, and and I'm really not. I I think when it comes to data, uh, IT has been asked to do a job that it is just not in a position to do. And, you know, from a data quality perspective, it's it's neither a creator or a customer, so it's like trying to, you know, to correct all these errors made by others. And and um, and, and and I think that, you know, IT organizations, the smart ones anyway, what they should really do is is recognize that and say, you know, we, we, we can't really do this well. And to lead responsibility for educating their business partners partners on why they can't do it well and on you know in the silo level and on the corporate level helping their their business counterparts figure out a better place to to, to manage the data and and you know take the lead for getting management of of data out of the IT organization and, and where it belongs and, and 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 so they can concentrate on what they can do well which is which is the technologies and you know tech departments really fall down with this data thing, so departments got to realize they got a lot of skin in the game, and and they can show they're probably in the best position in many companies. Show leadership to show leadership in in where management for the data belongs. Well, we're gonna wrap things up here, Tom. Um, before we go, I'd like to mention to everybody that, that uh, to fact will be joining us amongst. A dozen really top class, world class experts on data strategy at the CDO Vision Conference taking place in Austin, April 29 through 30, uh, takes place alongside the annual Enterprise Data World Show. 
So I'd like to see many of you there. Just uh, hop online and request an invitation. And uh, Shannon, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, you again, Tom. Shannon, you're going to tell everybody uh, about how we'll follow up with things and they can get copies of slides, et cetera. And thank you, Tony, and thank you, Tom, for this great presentation. And as always, thank you to our attendees who are so engaged and so interactive in everything that we do. We just love it. Um, and just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recording of the webinar on dataversity.net within two business days. And I will send a follow-up email to everyone by end of day Thursday with the links to the recording and the links to the slide. And thanks for attending today's webinar, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Everybody else.